Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Jeff Thomas and Kale Dowell at Archetype Wealth Partners. Uh, thanks for joining us today. This is our first webinar uh, of uh, uh, for advisors. Uh, we've done a bunch for clients, and uh, we know it's a strange time for everyone. And uh, you know, we, we've been thinking a lot about our old Morgan Stanley uh, colleagues who. Most of the wirehouse people are at home uh, for, for the foreseeable future, I guess. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of the independent folks are doing the same. So maybe one of the benefits, I know I've enjoyed uh, plugging into more webinars than I ever have before. Uh, hopefully you enjoy this today. And so really, uh, I wanted to just kind of uh, set the table. Since this is our first one, we would like to do this more often. Uh, we'd really like to, uh, to help share anything we've learned really in this business uh, with the rest of you. And, uh, but, but just to kind of explain uh, a little background and why we're doing this, uh, I, I thought what we talk about are our priorities. Really our priority here and our number one goal is really to just help build the kingdom, right? That's what we're all trying to do. And uh, what we're trying to do is help families put money in its proper place. You know, our mission statement at Archetype is to help people really families connect their money with their purpose and help those families thrive across generations. And so I think that's really what we're all trying to do as part of this community mm -hmm. of believers who are trying to help our clients, uh, you know, if they can implement biblical wisdom in, in their lives around money, we think they grow closer to God and closer to each other. So I know that happened in my life uh, where I was chasing money harder than God many moons ago, and that did not lead to a happy place. <laughs> I'll tell a little more of that story in a minute, but, uh, but, but we just want to help our clients really do the same thing. My marriage got better. My business got better. My relationship with my kids got better. When I got that, those priorities straight. And so I know we're all rowing in that same direction, and, uh, and we just wanted to share some things we've learned. We're gonna talk really about growing your practice today. You know, the title of this uh, webinar is How to Build a Gun Honoring Practice. So we're gonna talk about marketing and teams and really how to grow a practice. Um, and, and, and just as a little more context, I think almost everybody on this call has probably heard of Kingdom Advisors. If you haven't, check it out. Uh, but most of us are part of this community. And I think King of Advisors has done a magnificent job of building an army of, of, of the kind of folks that are on this call and our colleagues and friends and other members of King of Advisors. And, and they, they provide inspiration and equipping and a common set of language around biblical principles. And, uh, and we just look at ourselves, Kale and I, uh, Kale's the COO at, at Archetype. Uh, I'm, I'm the founder and CEO. We're just soldiers. Uh, in this army that Kingdom Advisors is building. We know Ron Blue always uses that term. He, he wanted to build an army of Christian financial advisors who would implement biblical wisdom into their practices and, and help our clients adopt those biblical principles. So now sort of if you kind of keep the military analogy going, <laughs> our branch of the military, we think, Kale and I, is implementation. Yeah. So we think kind of the gift we've been given is how do you implement running a practice. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, I'll give you a little background. Just a lot of you, I was looking at the list of folks tuning in. We know many of you, some of we don't, we don't know. So may, maybe you don't know a lot of the backstory. I'm going to just take a few minutes, uh, and, and I think it'll, it'll help you understand where we're coming from, and then we'll get into the real meat of the presentation on, on, on a few tips on how to, how to grow your practice. But just by way of background, uh, you know, I, I've been on the, in the financial services business for 30 years, uh, really on the advisory side for 25 years. Uh, you know, started my career at uh, Payne Weber, now UBS, was there for eight years and then 17 years at Morgan Stanley, and this is year four of Archetype. But in about 02 to 05, around the first 10 years of the business, uh, I got to a place where I was mentioning earlier, where I was just unsatisfied. The kids were great. I got two girls. Uh, my, my marriage was good. Uh, you know, we were involved in church. The practice was growing, you know, doing over a million bucks in the first five years. I, everything's good on paper, but I was wildly dissatisfied. And I, long story short, I started doing Bible study uh, to try to fix myself <laughs> and to find my purpose in life. And what I discovered there 
uh, was God showing me that my priorities with money were wrong and, and that I was putting money before him. And that is not a, a place that leads to success. So he just, every verse I would read would just scream at me, you're a steward, not an owner. Stop trying to be in control and putting money before me. And so uh, long story short, he got my attention. We changed our budget as a family, became more generous. That led to all kinds of wonderful things. You know how that works. Uh, in 06, I didn't know there's anybody else, by the way, in like 05 that thought this way. Yeah. I didn't know any of you people existed. I didn't know Ron Blue existed. In 06, a mentor of mine here in Houston was starting the National Christian Foundation in Houston. And, uh, and he rolled out this generous community initiative where uh, Kingdom Advisors was involved, NCF, generous giving, all these sort of things, Crown at the time. And, uh, and, 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 and so I learned about Kingdom Advisors. And I wrote Ron Blue kind of this love letter because I was like, wait, you wrote all these books? There's an organization of people that care about implementing biblical wisdom in their practice? This is fantastic. And so I, got, I went all in with uh, Kingdom Advisors kind of as they were ramping up in 06. Uh, through that process, I met Jeff Cave at Merrill Lynch, who had started the Christian Focus Group there. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's a genius idea. So I started the Christian Focus Group at Morgan Stanley. I know we have many Morgan Stanley people on the call today. That's how it started. We just copied what Merrill did uh, and we, we, we grew that. Uh, and then in 08, Ron Blue asked me to be kind of a coach for the Kingdom Advisor coaching program, but I was a little nervous about that. So uh, I said, hey, I'll do it, but how about I fly in early? It was kind of one of these noon to noon, one day a quarter type of meetings. And uh, so I would fly in early and he would disciple me in the mornings. And then, you know, I kind of had my table of folks. Some of them are on this call. Uh, and, and we had fun at that, at that coaching program for uh, for the rest of the day. In uh, 09, uh, I was in the Chairman's Club at Morgan Stanley, which is like the top 2% of producers. By the way, that never happened before I gave the business to God, uh, side note. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and that was uh, a, kind of a seminal thing. We had a meeting for the Chairman's Club in New York with James Gorman, still the CEO of uh, Morgan Stanley. And he had brought in a, uh, uh, a Harvard Business School professor to do this Myers-Briggs uh, kind of thing on all of us. And uh, they gave you sort of a famous business person in history that you were like. And mine was Sam Walton. And so I, that kind of confused me. I mean, I know it was Walmart, but I didn't really know what Sam Walton's personality was. And so uh, I asked, the, I called the guy over sort of doing it. And I go, hey, so what, what was Sam Walton's personality? He'd say, well... He goes, Sam Walton wasn't very creative. Uh, and I said, well, okay, I can relate to that. He goes, but the inefficiencies of his business drove him bananas. And so he had to start Walmart to, to just make it more efficient, implement all the things, these ideas that he had. And so that was, uh, that was a great moment of sort of personal understanding for myself. And I'm still kind of on that track. And, and, and that's kind of what Archetype's all about. Uh, now, in 2010, as the, as the uh, Kingdom Advisors coaching program was winding down in one of our little discipleship sessions, Ron Blue said something. Uh, a lot of you guys know uh, and, and, and ladies know him. Uh, he is a classic visionary. And he would tell you he's really more of a visionary, not an operator. And so he said, you know, I can't believe this RIA I started in 1979 is, this is 2010, is 50 million revenue, uh, 15 offices. And I had a moment of clarity that I wish for all of you. I hope you've had this kind of moment of clarity uh, where like my whole life came together. I literally hold, I, I heard God speak in my head, not audibly, although I did turn up and look over my shoulders. And he just said, uh, Jeff, uh, I want you to scale what this guy started, what, what Ron started. And, and, and I said, well, that sounds like fun, God. Uh, I have all these opinions. I'm on all these committees at Morgan Stanley. They don't listen to me a lot, but, but I'm on a lot of these committees. Uh, but I've never scaled anything. I just run uh, a team and I, I, I've never, you got the wrong guy. And I remember God saying, uh, that's why I, I've asked you to do this. Uh, I will do it. You just take instructions. You can't take any credit. So that, that was 2010. It's 10 years later. We're still on this journey. I still wake up every morning and just ask God what to do. And uh, we feel like he told us to share this information with you. So that's what we're doing uh, here today. It was another six years from 2010 to 2016 where uh, when he said scale, I just sort of threw myself into the Christian focus group with uh, Brad Hulse and many others there. 
to uh, really grow it. it. We had about 150 sort of people on an email list. We finally got it approved and got it up to about 600 members. Uh, but, but in 16, uh, you know, we, we were partnering with about 50 different advisors at Morgan Stanley. But what, what happened was the structure just didn't work. Okay, so from a teaming standpoint, you know, partnering was difficult. Those at, at wirehouses understand that. Communication was an issue. Uh, they were restricting our ability to communicate biblical wisdom. I understand that's loosening up. Praise God, that is awesome mm -hmm. for those of you uh, still at the wirehouse. Seems like it's loosening up and uh, that, that is awesome. But my job description, God had given me a job description to run a business, not, not be a financial advisor anymore and create a platform for other advisors. So I really needed to have a platform change. So that's why we started Archetype. And uh, one of the joys uh, of, of getting this rolling ha has been assembling a group of people. We'll talk about teams he here in a moment, but just to kind of come back to, to what we're gonna cover today, our scorecard for Kale and myself and really at, at our firm, is to help this community that, that we're all a part of become more effective and efficient, again, at delivering that biblical adv advice. And, you know, we can't be talking about the Bible and not have a, a Bible verse. So one of my favorites is Ephesians 2.10. And it says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And when I think about each person on this call, and hopefully the people that see the replay, I think about all the, all the people that God has for you to serve. And, uh, it, it, and, and we run into lots of advisors who are unbelievably sold out Christians, know this biblical advice so well, but they really struggle with gaining new clients. And, and we think God has this ideal model out there for you. And he's got all these people he wants you to serve. Today, we just wanna give you a, a few lessons he's taught us on how to get in front of more of those people. Uh, so we just want to help uh, the, the amazing people that are on this call serve more of the people that God has ready to be served for you. So that, that's really our, our, uh, uh, our why, if you will. <laughs> Thanks for sort of indulging me on, on, on telling the story. Uh, I have written all this in a book called Trading Up. We're going to give you a free copy uh, in an email at the end of this uh, webinar. So once again, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to really turn it over now to Kale Dow, who I said is the COO. So I'm kind of uh, turning into the big picture guy around here. And uh, Kale is the chief operating officer. I, I said, Kale, we need to do this, uh, this presentation. The number one question I got when I was running the Christian focus group at Morgan Stanley, it would kind of come in different forms, but it almost came every day in an email or a phone call. And I would spend really like an hour and a half to two hours a day having this exact conversation that we're gonna to have today, but it's actually gotten a little better since we've launched our own company, but how do you build a God honoring mm -hmm. business? And, and so that's the question we're addressing. Kale is great at communicating these things. I tell stories, so I'll probably interject stories and all that. I'm just an old producer guy, uh, and, but we're just kind of one beggar as, as Kale will point out, show another beggar where they got bread. But Kale is great at operating a business building a culture and, and, and explaining things in a really a linear fashion uh, uh, that I think will be really helpful. So with that, Kale, thanks for joining us and uh, please take it away. Well, thank you, Jeff. And thank you for sharing your story. Um, I think there's so many things that uh, probably, hopefully a lot of people, if you're listening in, uh, can relate to. Uh, the desire to scale, the desire to actually deliver biblical wisdom, the humility to go, I'm not really sure how sometimes, I gotta know some of it, but not all of it. How do I grow, how do I scale? Um, and then, of course, just this, the, the, the knowledge of, of there's been so many people along the path of your journey that have helped you. And I think that's part of what today's about. Very true. Is uh, we've, we've kind of marched ahead. And, and uh, since we've launched this company, we've tried to learn so much. And we have in such a short period of time. There have been so many people that have been generous to us. And we just want to share what we've learned. As, as Jeff said, one beggar showing another beggar where to get food. Uh, to that, that you might be benefited, that you might be inspired, encouraged, whatever it is that God's got uh, you working on, uh, specifically in, in kind of the context of, of the benefits of marketing and teamwork, which is common sense. I think we can all agree that we know that that's a good thing. Those are good things for us to improve upon. And so we just want to share what we've learned in this journey that's really benefited us, and we hope it benefits you. So when you think about scaling a God-honoring business of really any kind, uh, where my brain works, you know, I'm a big strategy guy, it's like, well, who's done it? right? Who's done this before? And in our industry, there've been some, some 
Ron Blue, a good example, right? Like people that have done some amazing thing, they've scaled some practices, et cetera. But in the context of, uh, for a lot of you guys at the Wirehouse, you know, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, whoever it might be, there's really not a scaled environment that's a God honoring practice uh, that's kind of on the top 10 leaderboard. So I, I had to kind of look outside the industry and kind of beg and plead. And fortunately, a lot of generous people willing to share their advice and their wisdom with us of who has done it in a different industry and how can we cobble together what they've done well and apply it to our own. And, and probably the one that comes to mind that I think most people can relate to, there's been several, but the one we'll kind of hit on today is, is Chick-fil-A. Um, so Chick-fil-A, uh, as everyone knows, great organization. Uh, it's a God honoring company. Uh, they're based on biblical principles. They don't put the cross on the chicken sandwich, so to speak, but uh, they're founded on biblical principles and they're unashamed about that. And I think that's been uh, you know, the number one thing that has led them to where they are today. At least Dan Caffey would say that. Um, but what, you know, I, I have this picture on the screen because I think a picture says a thousand words. All of you have probably been to Chick-fil-A in the line that's wrapped around the building twice, and yet they still manage to get you through it in 10 minutes. I mean, they're just geniuses at so many different things. And uh, what really sets them apart is they're competing in the top 10 fast food restaurants uh, in the United States, when you think about it. As a matter of fact, one of the statistics, uh, you can go look this up. Uh, the average Chick-fil-A store does more in revenue than Starbucks, Subway, and McDonald's combined. So they're doing something right, not just in terms of, of who they are and what they're delivering in a, in a unique experience, but even in the process and, 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 and kind of the implementation of what they're doing. And that's really what we're here to do is, is how are we implementing and how can it benefit others? And so from Chick-fil-A's own mouth, kind of there's four things that they've done that are very unique. Uh, first, of course, they're founded on biblical principles, which if you're on this call, there's a strong possibility you are too. So that's number one. Uh, they really work, as, as Ron often says, and, and Dan Cathy as well. Um, second, they've got a unique platform. There's a lot of platforms out there to, to build a business inside the wealth management industry. We're not going to really focus on that today, but that's critical, or it's critical to them. And the last two are really what we're going to focus on, which are process in people. So what are they doing that's unique that's enabled them to scale this, this God honoring business? And then how are they building the team? What are they doing from an alignment standpoint, culture, etc.? So we'll start with the process. So first, uh, you know, you go around like we have to all these amazing companies, uh, their chief marketing officers, you know, uh, consultants, etc. Uh, how do you actually scale a business? And this is kind of the long formula that I've tried to, to piece together. There's different words that different people have, but these are kind of the main things. And I'm going to make this simpler here in just a second. But uh, uh, from, from kind of a long version standpoint, first, you need to know who you are and what you have to offer. And chances are, if you've been doing wealth management for five years or more, you probably have a good idea about that. But sometimes you don't. You just haven't spent the time. And so uh, number one is, is knowing your identity. That's the foundation that you're going to stand upon. The second would be the niche. And we all know this, we've all heard this from, from marketing consultant, right? You need to pick your three ideal clients or whatever the case might be. Uh, we actually read a book called Scaling that was, was fantastic. And um, one of the things it talks about in there, we've heard this from some other uh, organizations that were uh, generous in sharing their wisdom with us is uh, really your ideal client should be one person. One person that if they hear your message, it's like an aha moment. It's like, oh, that, that's me, I need that. And so for us, we really honed it in on who is our ideal client, the one person that if we get in front of them, we know there's a 90% chance it's a close rate. And not because we're great salespeople, because but the fit is perfect. The fit of who we are and what we have to offer is just a match. Um, the third would be, of course, the message. And this is one that sounds simple, but actually a lot of people get wrong, which is what does your ideal client actually want? And sometimes I'll ask people, well, have you asked them? Have you asked them what they, that, that, what they want? We tend to make a lot of assumptions in this industry. We read articles that give us assumptions. Oh yeah, you know, ultra high net worth people want this. Uh, but when you sit down and actually ask them what they want, you kind of do that over time. You can do surveys, et cetera. You start to get a different message, uh, which is interesting. And it influences the way we communicate. Uh, the fourth one is awareness, which is probably one of the hardest. Uh, does your ideal client know who you are? And we'd like to think yes, but the reality is a lot of times they don't even know you exist. And so how do we increase the awareness? A lot of what we're going to talk about today is focused on that. Of course, personalization. So how will you solve their needs? This goes back to the kind of the niche, the message, the awareness piece. How do you know their needs and how are you going to solve their needs? Not just what do you offer? Maybe I'll kick in on that a little sure. bit. I, I know 
a lot of the wirehouse people for sure have seen Richard Wildman, you know, and he's an industry consultant. And I think most of these consultants, you know, just like our specialty is implementation, you know, a lot of these consultants have, you know, one thing they're a genius at, at talking about. Uh, I, I like Richard Wildman's thing. I think his genius is figuring out how the client uh, sees us. And so his big thing is talking about, uh, you know, what, what are the benefits mm. of what you sell a as opposed to how many years you've been in business, the features, yeah, the features, of course. you know, your portfolio, all, all of these kind of things. But what are the benefits to the client? What's the language they would use? Mm -hmm. So I think that messaging, you yeah. know, you start getting their language, which allows you to personalize <laughs> it for them using their language yeah. as opposed to, because I always want to tell them how smart I am. And yeah. they tend to not care. Yeah. <laughs> they care yeah. about their own needs. And then if they're going to give a referral, they're trying to help their friend. Sure. So they're going to use their own language, not how many years of experience to scale have, but, oh, my problem has a friend. I know a person who can solve that problem. So using the client's language as opposed to the stuff we make up in our in That's the a good point. Something that's that's been interesting as we've gone through this process is, of course, in our industry, right, we, we deal a lot with, with trading, with portfolios, et cetera. Performance does matter, but is it number one? And statistically speaking, it's not number one of what clients are looking for. Sure, it's in the top several, but uh, that's just fascinating to learn that and then knowing what's number one specific to that niche. That's how you start to tailor your message and, and, and even building the awareness for that specific niche. Um, so the delivery, so how is the message actually being delivered? Are you doing that? In what avenues? Uh, how, what technologies are you using? Uh, who's doing the business development side? Who's giving the pitch? Uh, all these things matter. And then the last one, uh, that's kind of the holy grail we all talk about a lot, but very few of us actually uh, capitalize on is who's actually referring you? How are you generating additional leads that maybe you, you wouldn't have otherwise? So I like to think in terms of simplicity. So I like to take complex kind of things and, and a lot of ethereal thing and kind of break it down into, okay, what does this actually mean and how do we actually implement on it? So when I see all this kind of long formula, uh, I like to break it down into kind of three simple objectives. You know, all of that to me fits inside three things. Uh, number one is recognition. Are you able to generate leads? Are there leads being generated that you can follow up on, that you can connect with, that fit your target market, et cetera? So number one is recognition. And we're going to talk about how to do that. Number two is results. Are people actually saying yes? And this goes a lot back to the message, to the personalization, is what you're delivering of value to the client that you're or the prospect that you're talking to. And then last is the referral piece. Are you easily referable? And we're going to talk about what that means. So to kind of Taylor, I said, I say, tee up what we're, how we're going to do this. Uh, first, I'm going to give everyone a very kind of broad marketing lesson on like marketing 101. And some of you might be familiar with this. Some of this might be new, but this is what they call the marketing funnel. There's different versions of this, different words that get used, but simplistically, uh, you want to get people from the top of the funnel down all the way to the bottom of the funnel. So for us, you know, a big piece, one of the things we talk about a lot around here is how do we create raving fans? And I'll give a story here. Uh, Horst Schultze, who we've gotten to know, he was a former CEO of Ritz Carlton. Um, he kind of took it from where it was, you know, historically speaking, to becoming uh, his kind of mission for the company was to be the number one customer service brand in the world, which at the time when he took over was Tiffany's. Uh, and then he unseated that uh, during his tenure there. And one of his big things was uh, it, they were really, really big on customer service. And I got to spend about three hours with them one-on-one. -on -one. He would tell all these amazing stories, but one of the big, big takeaways from that he shared with me was for him, it wasn't just about creating a satisfied customer or a loyal customer. He wanted to deliver an experience that was amazing enough, meaningful enough that someone would talk about it either at the appropriate prompting or even without being prompted. And he gives this example of going into a bank, right? You go into the bank and, and you need to change some coins out, let's just say, and the person takes care of you, you're satisfied, but are you going to go tell your friends about the experience? Probably not. But when they go above and beyond, they do something unique, they, they personalize the experience, now it can be more meaningful, and that's where you kind of create raving fans. So we want to get them from the top of the funnel of, the, of I don't even know who you are, to how do we create a raving fan? So at the top of the funnel, we've got the awareness piece, and that's when we disrupt them, right? They're scrolling through Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever, or they're on the golf course, wherever they are, whether it's technology or in person, they don't know who you are and they're disrupted, and now they know who you are. 
The second piece is leading them down that funnel to consideration. What is it that you're offering that speaks to them? And that's where they start to consider. And ideally you want them to go, oh, that's me. That sounds like me. The conversion process, now we're getting into the actual business development piece, the sales process, where there's probably an actual person talking, trying to uh, explain how what we, are do, what we do really uh, uh, is personalized to their needs. And that's when the conversion starts and that's when they become a client. So that's where the results side is, right? And this is where they start to receive value. We start to delight the customer by delivering that value. Over a period of time, we build loyalty. And when we go above and beyond in the service we deliver and making sure that they understand the meaningful experience that we're creating, which sometimes has to be pointed out, by the way, that's when we can get people to a place of others are missing out. And that's the, that's the goal. If we can get people to a place of others are missing out, that's when they want to talk about it. And if you think about it in your life, there's probably something you do, a product that you love that if it came up in conversation, right? Maybe it's a workout plan. Maybe it's a diet. Maybe it's uh, a tech, uh, you know, an iPhone versus an Android. You, you love it so much that if it comes up in conversation, you're probably going to talk about it. And that's the goal of the marketing funnel. So what does that mean specifically? What do we do in those different buckets of the funnel? That's what we're going to talk about next. So first is the awareness campaign. So this is, and, and, and by the way, I'll preface this by saying uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff on the, the, the slide here. You might not be able to do all of it, either just by function of capacity or maybe even restriction of where you are. Some of y'all are at an RIA, you can sky's the limit. Some of you are at a bigger firm, you've got some restrictions on what you can and cannot do. Regardless, there are things on here in each one of these that you should be able to capitalize on. So the more the merrier, but uh, I wanna make sure that that's clear. So top of the funnel is the awareness campaign. So this is everything from a database, right? We got to have leads inside of a database that needs to be managed. Those leads need to be inputted in. How are we capturing those leads? Consumer research, right? What does the client actually want? How do we speak to them? How do we make them aware based on what they need? Webinars, like we're doing today, blogs, videos, the right website design if you're on your own, SEO, search engine optimization of when people are searching for financial advisor Houston, are you coming up or maybe specifically uh, financial planning for retirement, things like that. Is that triggering something in the, the, the search engine to populate you at the top so that you get a click? Because all you're looking for is a look. That's where awareness starts. A newsletter, branding, all these things and more kind of contribute to the awareness piece. Moving down the funnel to consideration, this is where PR comes in. Uh, do, do, other, do other industry, uh, you know, uh, the, the place where your client might be, um, do they know who you are? Are they aware of you? Are, they, are you posting in those areas? Uh, are you running an email campaign to a targeted list based on the database back at the awareness stage that you've created? Uh, are you doing white papers for people to kind of consider, hey, this is something unique to me? Um, educational events. Chances are there's something, if, if you're kind of going, well, I don't know if I have any unique or original content, let me maybe just ask it this way. Is there some theme that you consistently hammer on with your clients? you know, one little piece of, of wisdom that you have known that like every client you share it with, like, oh, that's good. Like, thanks for sharing that. Because if you do, that's something original. That's something you can write in a, a, a white paper about. That's something you can host at an event about, uh, perhaps even do a speaking engagement about. Um, and then of course, uh, peer discussion as well. Are you involved in a community, particularly where your clients or your uh, uh, ideal client might be, where there's some peer discussion going on, where they are seeing your name, they're seeing your expertise, they're seeing you as a trusted voice in that community. Moving down the funnel, this is conversion. How are you then personalizing the value proposition? So the first two tops, the reason I have that orange is you haven't sold anything yet in those first two buckets of the, of the marketing funnel. You haven't made a single pitch. All you're doing is just making people aware of who you are and a consideration for is this person that someone that I wanna trust? Are they offering something that's unique to me? And all along the way, you're tracking this so that when you get to a place of delivering a value proposition, you're able to personalize it for them. So are you delivering a personalized value proposition? Is it relatable? Case studies are very helpful with this because that's when people can really look in the mirror and go like, oh yeah, I'm a business owner about to go through a transition. And he's telling me about a business owner that he helped that went through transition gosh, I need him. So the conversion piece really comes down to that personalization. And that's really where, this is where business development tends to happen. The orange, that's really the marketing piece. Now we're getting into the delighting, the, 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 the delight phase. I call this the unboxing. A lot of y'all probably have an iPhone. When you bought it, it was in a nice neat box. It felt good when you opened it up. Maybe you've bought something online and it came to the house and you had this moment where you're like, wow, that's, this is nice packaging. Well, that doesn't relate apples to apples to our industry. But when someone becomes a client, 
what's the experience? Is it a slog of paperwork as it often uh, can be very easily? Or is it, is, it a, is it experience that they go, man, I'm so glad I just made this purchase. So how do we deliver an unboxing experience that's worth talking about? And that kind of goes into, uh, for us, uh, what we call client experience, historically kind of client service. Do we have the right people that are really helping with that onboarding process? Do we have it smooth? Do we have it tailored? How do we make it meaningful? Loyalty. This is getting down into really now delivering the advice. Are we delivering above and beyond service? Is the advice meaningful? Are we able to track the metrics of what we're saying we're doing for them? Are, are they able to go back and see like, yeah, we're making progress. I'm glad I made this decision last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I'm a loyal client. We're doing client events that are, that are a blessing to them, that they feel good about. They feel like they're exclusive in a club. Uh, wow moments. This is something that we're big on that we learned from Ritz Carlton. He would give everyone in the company, as an example, everyone in the company had a budget to do a wow moment for any client. And it was already approved. And so the idea here was, uh, he gave me one example of uh, a valet and a, a guy, a regular that comes to the hotel, uh, notices he's always got Powerade in the, in the cup holder when he, when he brings his car in. And so the valet makes sure uh, when he goes and gets the car, he goes to the vending machine, he buys a nice ice cold Powerade, guy comes to pick it up and there's a fresh ice cold condensation dripping off the side Powerade sitting there in the cup holder for the client. It costs three bucks, but the, the, the client goes, wow, you noticed, you cared, you took action. That's where it doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but that's where you start to really build loyalty. And when you do that enough, you start to build raving fans. And that's when you can start conducting surveys. Hey, what's working? What's not working? How can we do it better? You can start to analyze the funnel. You've got them from the top to the bottom. How, why, why did people get, why did, how do they move along that chain? Why did they move along that chain? Where were the gaps? Where did it fail? Uh, what do we need to get rid of? What do we not need to spend time? Where do we need to be spend more time on? And then of course, empowering referrals, because when you have raving fans, they want to talk about you. So it's easy to move into that referral phase. So that's the engine, as we call it, of how you actually scale and build a God honoring practice from a marketing standpoint is you have to be doing every single one of these things. You can't just do one because they all work in tandem with each other. And until you get someone to the bottom of that funnel, you can't go back and circle back to the top. So the, the, the marketing funnel, the engine, as we call it, this is kind of the critical piece as we've learned it. Uh, not just, not just with our business, this is, we're, we're doing this. We're not perfect at it every day. We're tweaking, adjusting, et cetera, learning more, but this is what we've learned from all these amazing people that we've had the, that have been so generous with us sharing, taking little bits and pieces. Some of it's apples and oranges because of different industries, but the principles are fundamental and they transcend. And that's how we've built this engine that we're sharing with you today. And that leads to, as you noticed, right? There's a lot of different people along this chain. And in some cases, when I say a lot of people, it might be you, you might be the one person and I get it. I know that's, that's difficult, that's challenging, there's capacity, et cetera. But ideally you've got people along this chain. You have people that are just doing the marketing. You have people that are just doing the business development. You have people that are just doing the advice, people that are just delivering the uh, experience. All of that's creating a raving fan. Uh, and so that's where the teamwork thing comes in. So we're going to talk about teamwork next. And uh, I love this slide because I think a picture says a thousand words. You know, our industry, historically speaking, is really predicated on what I call the black box, or in this case, the one man band, right? And I'm not knocking it because if you've ever seen a one man band, like in some town square in Italy or something like that, it's actually really impressive. Like, I can't do it. Um, but they're able to, you know, play the banjo, bang the drum, you know, they're tapping their foot with the cymbal and all this stuff. It's, it's a, quite a sight to behold. Um, but it's, it's, it's a one-man band at the end of the day. It's very different. It's, it's not intended to be the same, and it's not the same as an orchestra. And so when you go back to that marketing funnel, the, the ideal situation is that you've got an orchestra, uh, and you have a team that is actually working in tandem with one another in each one of those pieces of the funnel. So who's creating the awareness, or the recognition, who's actually capturing the results, and who is generating the referrals from these raving fans. All those people, all those pieces have to work in tandem and all of that generally uh, uh, operates at its best when you have a different person doing each one of those functions. So teamwork is critical to the success of building a God honoring practice. And again, as I alluded to earlier, you might not be there yet or have the ability yet uh, to do that, but thinking ahead will really help you consider the processes so that you can, uh, when the time or opportunity arises, you can quickly move that process off yourself and onto somebody else. Um, the, the last piece of the teamwork 
and we'll get into to questions here shortly, is alignment. So now that we talked about teamwork, and we know that teamwork's important for the marketing funnel to build a god honoring practice, uh, who do you actually capture? And this is, this is critical, because I think, uh, uh, largely speaking, our, our industry as a whole, not just any one company, but has done this a disservice. And, and as we kind of waded into it and looked at, like, particularly, uh, particularly once we got outside the wirehouse and we're able to see a lot of the different models, some good, some terrible, but what is, what is the right kind of model that can work for, uh, for you? And it's going to be individualized, personalized to your unique team, what you're doing, but really five things have to align. And that's what I've got on the screen here. Financial alignment. So of course, do dollars and cents, but incentives align with capacity that enables you to leverage a team. And a lot of times we've come across instances or we've heard from other companies that experimented with this and they said, hey, when the financial incentives weren't aligned, it did not go well. You don't get the best people. There's a high turnover. So all those things have to come together. Um, mission alignment. Are the people that are on your team, are they like-minded? Are they, as Jeff says, rowing in the same direction? Because if they're not, it's, it's probably more of a headwind than a tailwind to get you to where you go. And I know, again, that can be difficult depending on where you are, but mission alignment is critical to success. Uh, and, and particularly from some of these companies that we've learned from like Chick-fil-A, this is number one on their hit parade. If, if it's not mission aligned, they don't do it. Uh, uh, there's a Maybe great... I'll tell a story on that. Yeah, if you, if you jump don't mind. in here. Uh, we had, a, we had a consultant come to our team uh, when we were at Morgan Stanley uh, years ago. And uh, I had been in different partnerships over the years and that sort of thing. And I was in this long-term partnership. And uh, we had a consultant come in and kind of do a team assessment, you know, the personality stuff. And it was just a couple of day engagement. And I'm driving the guy, the consultant, to the airport. And, uh, and I said, you know, it was nice, some of the personality stuff, how we could get along better and all. But I said... He, he was in his late sixties. He'd been doing this for like 40 years. And I said, hit me between the eyes. Like, is there <laughs> something, uh, I know you probably saw something like, give me some meat. I mean, just lay it on me. I can take it. You know, what, what did you see? And he said, uh, he said, uh, well, as I interviewed the team, everybody could repeat the mis mission and vision mm -hmm. of what you were trying to accomplish except for your senior partner. <laughs> the one other got a biggest shareholder, if you will, in that partnership. And I knew it, but I was just in this place where I knew we were trying to go in a direction and we were kind of, uh, I knew he wasn't fully invested in the mission and couldn't even repeat it, honestly. Uh, was kind of happy to take the paycheck, if you will. But, but uh, and that doesn't make him a bad person. It was just an alignment. With, with where we were trying to head to mm. grow and scale and all those things. And he just didn't want to do it. And so at the end of the day, uh, we had to separate that. And so that mission alignment, and ever since we got that straight, mm. uh, the, the growth has been exponential without uh, just the pressure of, of, of bringing somebody along that's, that's not aligned. And, and the one thing that I always talk about uh, when people would ask, especially the first couple of years of, of archetype, they say, well, How's it been, you know, going from uh, the big warehouse? And I said, you know, to me, this alignment, you know, we use this alignment word mm -hmm. in five different places. <laughs> this alignment thing to me is the biggest deal possible. So to not be confused, to be really clear in your leadership with your team about what direction you're going, who you're serving, what everyone's roles are, that's what he's really getting into here. I felt like before uh, we launched our own company, we had about 50, we were accomplishing about 50% of what God was telling us to accomplish. That's how mm -hmm. I felt. And so I thought, well, okay, we're all math people. If, if we can launch this thing, and I know maybe we can't get to 100% this side of heaven, but if we can get to 99 or something, it'll be about twice as much fun. And, uh, and the big surprise to me, uh, and so this is how I would answer the question, what's been the biggest surprise or how is it? I said, the closer I've gotten to full alignment with, with, with God's purpose for me, and, and especially in this business, because I feel like we're living out our calling in the business. This is a primary delivery system for living out our calling. Uh, it's been exponential. The joy has been exponential. Forget the business that comes, because then all your clients see how happy you are, how happy you are to serve them, how everybody is working together, all of these things. Uh, just this total alignment with 
with God's will for your life, and then this mission for the business that attracts everyone else at the business, that is the most fun I have ever had uh, in business. So this alignment thing, to me, uh, it, it's a word we use uh, a lot around here because, we, well, we have a client who uh, just got his PhD in uh, mechanical engineering, for example, right. right? And I was talking to him about this alignment issue because he's looking for a new job. And he said, uh, and we were talking about finding a place to fit and culture fit and all that. And, he, and, and I said, oh, you just finished your PhD. I said, alignment. We t and I told him the story I just told you guys. I said, what's a, what's a story from engineering, the importance of alignment? Oh, yeah. Isn't there some kind of physical property? He goes, I just wrote my PhD. <laughs> you know, some of these people get very specific. He, he does it on the rotor blades inside of a jet engine. Okay, so he knows that if that rotor blade isn't perfectly aligned with all the other rotor blades, you can't even get off the ground in a, in, a, in a jet. And so if it's just a millimeter off, just one of them, it, it, it can, it can, you can't even get, and if they're perfectly aligned, you know, you, you can fly for thousands of miles at tens of thousands of feet. And so I just love that illustration of, yeah. of the difference. So sorry to interrupt, you know, but, but I, uh, I, this alignment thing to me is, is central because we, anyway, I know, I've had teams that are unaligned and I know we just couldn't make as much progress and couldn't grow when we had that alignment. So please continue. Thank yeah, you. and that, that's a good, thanks for interrupting. And uh, one of the stories that came to mind as you were sharing that, again, back to Horst Schultze, uh, CEO of Rich Carlton. Uh, you know, one of the things he told me that I thought was so critical was when they were starting, when they were really growing uh, uh, Ritz Carlton and he would hire people. Again, his mission was very specific. I wanna be the number one customer service brand in the world. And he said he would ask everyone that he hired, whether it was a janitor or a CFO, he would say, do you want to help me build the number one customer service brand in the world? Because that's what he was, that's, he said, that's the job. Okay. Yeah. You might do some janitorial work or yeah, you might run numbers all day and help us, you know, figure out where we're making investments. But at the end of the day, you're helping me build the number one customer service brand in the world. And that really stuck with me. And uh, they do this thing, uh, they call it lineup every single morning and they repeat the 24 customer service principles and the vision, the mission, et cetera. We don't go that crazy, but every week we've got a weekly call for the entire company and we repeat the vision and the mission and the values. We could, it's called the napkin test, right? Can everyone in the company, Jeff kind of alluded to this with his former senior partner, you know, like, can they write it down on a piece of paper? Because if not, they might not be aligned. So having that alignment on the mission is really critical. Process alignment moving forward. Uh, does the delivery of what you do, uh, the advice that you give, is it consistent? Does it enable you to create efficiencies to maximize the value offering to clients? And what we've noticed uh, from talking to a lot of different places is a lot of times the process depends on the individual advisor. So that might be a bigger company, but everybody's doing their own little thing. And that's, that's hard. I'm not saying it can't work, but it's hard when it's not aligned to really maximize on the efficiencies of the process. So process alignment, that enables you when it is efficient to have more capacity to actually deliver memorable experiences. Marketing alignment, going back to the engine we just talked about. Do you have a way where you, because of that consistency of your process and your mission, where it's, it's the, the marketing engine isn't just benefiting one person, but it's benefiting the team, it's benefiting the company, the organization, whatever it might be, the practice, the book of business, um, that you can have more opportunities to impact lives, which really goes back to the beginning of, you know, we're, we, you know the goal is to, build, scale, a God-honoring practice so that we can deliver biblical wisdom in people's lives. Well, the more opportunity we have to do that, the more that kind of checkbox, that, that uh, uh, scorecard uh, fills up. We want to deliver meaningful impact. We want to deliver biblical wisdom in people's lives. Well, that means we need more, more of a message. We need more clients. We need more all of the above to do that with. And that's where the marketing alignment comes in. And if you do all these things, if you do those four, now you start to build a culture you start to develop a culture and nurturing that culture and creating incentives and having that alignment and having a, 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 a general uh, uh, a way to, to uh, really leverage and maximize impact and fun. That's where the magic really starts to happen. And there's a lot of great books on there. I can, if anyone's interested, email us, we'll, we'll send that email link at the end of this, but email us. I've got tons of books for you to read. It's probably one of my favorite subjects, culture. We'll probably do another webinar at some point just on culture. Uh, but when the culture's aligned and all these other four kind of go into that, that make part of making up the culture, that's where I think Jeff talks about, hey, I thought it would be twice as fun, right? Mathematically speaking, but it's really exponential. exponential. Yeah. Um, so that being said, we're going to move on to uh, 
uh, the, the last piece we're going to do is probably the, the it's, it might sound a little funny, but I think it's, it's right on the nose. And uh, it's a question that I think everyone asks internally, but they don't necessarily ask it out loud. And that's this question. And I'll let Jeff maybe talk about this a little bit. But the question is how to not be that guy or gal at church. So this is kind of where it went, right? So we've given you kind of the, uh, the high level of kind of the, the marketing plan, how to build a team, you know, the, the importance of alignment. Because if you're not aligned, it's just you're doing things in, in little bits and pieces. And, 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 and the more alignment you have, the more you can implement all of that funnel we, we, we showed you. But, but in, in these calls, I was just, when we were putting this together, I was just hearkening back to all of the questions. We still get them uh, from all kinds of advisors about, you know, growing their practice and just taking it down to the most basic level. You know, a lot of people are, are on this call are involved in their church. That's clearly a, a, a great place to get clients from, but they don't want to be that person that everybody <laughs> walks the other way when you walk into the sanctuary. Of course, no, not many people are walking into a sanctuary right now, but when you walk in again yeah. uh, one day or you're on your Zoom call, you know, they don't want to avoid you. Uh, and, and, and so... Uh, I'll let uh, Kale kind of walk you through these things, but I'll, I'll just tell one story about that. And, and I was uh, uh, running the foundation at our church, and uh, it's just a foundation where people leave money uh, during life, uh, but, but especially at death, and that really supports the church. And so, uh, you know, I put together a little seminar uh, on behalf of the foundation to just educate the congregation basically about two things. I go to a Methodist church, so there's a, a, a Texas Methodist foundation uh, that does education about end-of-life giving, right, and, uh, and, and techniques on that, basically estate planning, if you will. So I had uh, the, the chairman of that come and talk uh, and, and give advice about doing wills and, the, and, the, and this sort of thing and how you could leave money to the church. And then we also had the local National Christian Foundation uh, president come and speak about illiquid giving. And uh, really, I just introduced them, let them fly, thanked everybody for coming, and, uh, and bought them some sandwiches. That, that was my role. And I had a, uh, a friend of mine that used to be in a Sunday school class together. We had launched another one. He had gone with that new launch years ago. And I remember he had started this little software company with uh, 12 people. That's what I remembered. It was 12 people in my head. But that was like 10 years ago at this point, and this is many moons ago. And he said, uh, he said, hey, you know, I really like that illiquid uh, giving presentation. You know, my company, uh, we're selling it. And uh, yeah, could I talk to you about that? I said, sure, we'll, we'll talk. And so we ended up having lunch at a later time and all that. Well, I was figuring, well, this is probably pretty small, 12 people. I mean, how, how big could it be? Well, the Carlisle Group was buying the company. It was 300 employees, <laughs> and it was for hundreds of millions of dollars. So it ended up being, uh, it, it, it's one of our biggest clients to, to, to date. And, and so it's just things like that where, you know, we're just trying to give education to people. Uh, I've taught lots of classes at church on calling and uh, just all kinds of things that I love doing anyway. Yeah. I love doing anyway, but people find out what you do and they will seek you out. So I try not to solicit anybody at church, but have them find us. And I just try to serve well. And so uh, th that I think is a hot topic actually mm -hmm. within the Kingdom Advisor uh, community. And we're happy to continue that conversation out. So how yeah. does that fit into your slide? So kind of based <laughs> on his story, right? Like I kind of take it back to those three R's we started with, recognition, recognition results, referrals, right? Recognition comes from maximizing non-sales opportunities. He was just providing education, right, on illiquid giving in this context. And that's the maximization of that non-sales opportunity. But it does what? It does awareness, right? Awareness and consideration like, oh, there's, I, didn't, I didn't even know Jeff was a financial guy. But man, like I, yeah, I see him up there. He talked talk about what he did, you know, and, and wow, consideration. Like he clearly like knows a little bit about this stuff. Like maybe it starts to, to develop a, a sense of who this person is in that person's brain. So the recognition piece did not have to involve a sales pitch. Um, results, leverage your whole team where possible. For, for us, we're in, a, we're in a place where we can do this. Not everyone can. But when I say leverage your whole team as, as possible, uh, you, can, you, you don't necessarily have to be the one selling. Uh, and so if you, have a, if you have part of a team, uh, you can put another person in that role to actually pitch the actual business. Uh, but it also talks about the whole team from a marketing standpoint, from who's delivering the education, all this kind of stuff. You just want to be 
going back to that recognition piece, known as someone that's doing this uh, in the church organization. Um, and then the last piece is referrals. And, and when, you, when, this does, when you do this well, uh, when you are leveraging that engine, that marketing funnel that we talked about, you're building that recognition, you're, you're starting to deliver, deliver results that are coming not because of a sales pitch, but that's going to start to be communicated around town, so to speak, inside the church bubble, because it is a bubble, as we all know, gossip spreads fast, but so does success. And so they're going to start going, hey, oh yeah, you need a guy, you should talk to Jeff, like everybody uses Jeff, but no one's afraid of Jeff because no one's, no one's afraid of him coming up and going, hey, I heard you just joined the church. You know, I sell insurance or I sell this. Or that. <laughs> we all know that guy and we don't want to be him. And so that's kind of what the question is nod to is how do we not be that guy, but still maximize the opportunity that's sitting right in front of us. And so that's part of the reasons why we wanted to deliver this presentation today is even just to get this specific on, on this one question, but give some context on what's being done out there at different levels um, so that you might be able to be encouraged, inspired, motivated, whatever it is, benefited to implement some of this uh, for yourself and hopefully uh, grow your practice, book a business, so that the goal, again, so that we can continue to implement biblical wisdom in the lives of clients, because that's the magic, at least for us, and I'm sure if you're on this call, it is for you. That's where the calling really comes in. That's where we're delivering meaningful impact. It's not about whether we, we all know, it's not about getting 1% more than the next guy in return. It's about whether or not somebody actually knows Jesus. That's the goal. And so how do we leverage all these tools at our disposal, the calling that we have, the awareness that we have in people's lives, the, the access, because make no mistake, as we all know, with finance, as a financial advisor, we have incredible access to people's lives. We get the, uh, I think it was Billy Graham that once said, hey, show me someone's calendar in their pocketbook and I'll tell you exactly what they, who, what they care about. Uh, we actually get the pocketbook. Um, so we have an inordinate access to people's lives. So how are we stewarding that? That's what motivates us. And that's why we wanted to give this presentation today so that you might be encouraged, might be benefited to help scale and grow your practice. So that being said, uh, we'll close it out with some questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions, there's a Q&A feature that you should see in your Zoom, uh, probably either towards the top or towards the bottom of your screen. Uh, and so if you have any uh, questions, feel free to, uh, to ask them, type them in there, and we can answer them. Um, and then while any questions are coming through, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of different things. Um, uh, a, uh, we did, or I already got a question about a, a link to download the presentation. Following this, following the conclusion of this, we'll be sending out an email that you'll receive that has a link to download the presentation, a link to the recording if you want to rewatch it, or you've got a friend that couldn't be on that said, hey, give me the notes, you can just send them the recording. Um, uh, a link to Jeff's book uh, for free. Um, and then a, a little survey that we'd love for you to take. If you don't mind, it'll take literally less than 60 seconds, but just what did you, was it, was this good <laughs> or not? And is there anything you'd like to hear about in the future that we might have some knowledge on? Cause that's what we're trying to do is just educate, be a part of this community and be generous with what God has given us and other people have given to us. We want to share it with everyone uh, that we love and appreciate as well. Um, so that being said, uh, one question that's coming in, uh, how, how do I do this and be an advisor <laughs> at the same time this is it's a good question if you want to take the first exactly <laughs> that's kind of why we put the last slide in there yeah. uh you know the, the the things that was going to my brain i know a lot of this you know i know when i saw this i said you know i know a lot of you you know there's probably a range of experience i'm sure there is you know on on the call from some new people uh, in the industry uh some people have been around for even longer than i have and and so uh, you know, we know that it's hard uh, in smaller practices to implement all of these things, but hopefully you can pick one thing. Um, you know, I think this thing at church, that's why I put that in there. I, I, for me, it's a place to serve, not a place to sell. And, uh, uh, but we, we did this thing when, when the National Christian Foundation of Houston uh, started, uh, and, and uh, I was on the board for a couple of terms, and they would show like where, where most of the money was being given. Our dinky little Methodist church was on this list, is not a mega church. And, uh, and they're like, why is this dinky Methodist church keep showing up in the biggest giving through MCF? And it was only because we would constantly uh, kind of expose them to, to, to the tools they had. And uh, so a lot of the giving was being done uh, through NCF, but, uh, but, but I never, you know, did any kind of sales seminar uh, there. And so I think these practical things on teaching biblical wisdom at church, just starting little things about, it, it, you know, 
I'm an old recovering salesperson, so I always have to take off my sales hat and put on my service hat every morning. <laughs> and how can I serve people? And then they'll ask to do business. I think in the referral thing, another mm -hmm. practical tip, uh, if you really don't have a big team or can't do things, we, we are kind of obsessed with this topic of referrals and becoming more referable. So the better you do your job, the more referable you become. But there's all of these industry studies and so forth that show that really probably 70% of your clients are mm -hmm. willing to refer you, but, but you haven't given them an opportunity. You haven't told them, uh, kind of reflected back to them language they can use mm -hmm. to speak to their friend. And, and if you don't have a niche, it's hard for them. So if you could express to them what your niche is and the kind of people you really serve and what the minimum might be, yeah. maybe they think these people are too small or too big or whatever. But if you know, like one of the focuses we have is business owners, private business owners selling their companies, 10 million plus who want to be generous. Okay. Most of them are Christians, not all of them. And uh, so we, we say that all the time to people. If, if you know somebody selling a company, kind of 10 million plus, and they're generous, we'd love to talk to them. Well, now that, that shortens instead of saying, hey, who do you who know? Do you know? <laughs> well, I know a lot of people. Yeah. But if you can narrow it to we help this specific kind of person, man, that really helps them help you. They're actually not trying to help you. They're yeah. trying to help their friend with a problem solve that problem. Yeah. So I think those are two very practical things. Teach a Bible study, bring resources uh, around biblical wisdom at church. Teach, just teach it. Don't sell, just teach it. Uh, they'll find you. And then from a referral, get tight on that niche. When I read that scaling book, uh, uh, Kale was referencing, man, it hit me like a ton of bricks because we had three niches, even on our website. See, you know, C-suite people, partners at law firms and accounting firms and business owners. And we, we, we came down to one niche that we just obsess over. And uh, it just makes it cleaner for everybody to, 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 to tell the story. And the one thing they said was, you know, nine out of 10 people won't be that niche that you get. But that's okay. You're not running them off. I thought we might run them off, the other people, the partners, and the C-suite people. But they're not offended by you having one niche. It's okay. So anyway, I think tight niche uh, help the clients you do have understand the kind of people you're looking for and serve best and then to serve uh, your, those are easy places to start and then as you develop more of a team in, a, in an organization you can do more of the things we've talked about but listen i just want to thank everybody for joining in i know that's kind of the end of our time uh there, you can find us we'll send an email out just respond to that email so a couple of questions that came in I, I just want to sure. make note of this since we don't have time to answer it, but i will follow up uh, directly and answer your questions. So just as FYI. Well, we want to respect everybody's time. I know you gave us an hour and it's a, a minute over. So, uh, <laughs> but we started a couple of minutes late. So thank you for uh, tuning in and, and, and let us know what we can do better. This survey, I, I mean, I know I skip a lot of surveys, but <laughs> we're giving you some freebies uh, along with the survey. So if you don't mind, uh, help make us better. And we'd love to do more of this and have other topics. But just like we said, ask Ask the customer what they want. Yeah. You tell us what you want, and, and, and that's what we'll do. And, uh, and we hope to do this more and see you all. Uh, blessings to each of you as you go forth and, uh, uh, and serve your clients uh, in, in a loving way in reflection for what God's done for us. Thank you, guys.